Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Kabir Considers. In this video, I'm going to react to five disturbing 911 calls made by killers. Now this is going to be something almost surreal to listen to because, you know, to, to, to be capable of killing someone else, you know, taking someone's life, and then you then call the authorities to either let them know what you did or what you're about to do. The kind of person that can do that, I just, I've never, and I hope to never cross paths with that kind of person. It's just, it's just insane. So this video here is gonna be really interesting to just hear their voices, what they said. So yeah, this is gonna be really, really interesting. So let's do it. Hmm. From a teenager who confessed to a double murder to a serial killer who called 911 many times. Good God. Today, Fact Faction looks at five killers' disturbing calls to emergency services. Jake Evans. What did he do? First up is the shocking confession made by 17-year-old Jake Evans. 17. Who called 911 to report the murder of his mother and younger sister. In the call, which was made in 2012, Jake explained in terrifying detail how he killed both his mother and sister using a gun he had stolen from his grandfather oh my and talked God. about his thoughts before and after the killings. Why? He explained that he was influenced by the horror film Halloween. He admired the killer in the film because he did not have any empathy. Leading up to the incident, Evans had gotten angry at his 15-year-old sister Mallory due to hearing her say something racist. According to Evans, this made him despise his family, and as a result, he saw them as bullies and racists. Oh In his gosh. full four-page confession, Jake also... I mean, okay, you can be upset with things your family says and does, but you don't kill them. You don't kill... I mean, to be honest, hearing this... I usually don't agree with movies having, you know, like age ratings and things like that, but okay, I, I see why. Now I see why. Also explained that he was planning on killing his grandparents who lived opposite his house, oh as well God. as his older sister, but had second thoughts after the murders. In 2015, Evans was sentenced to 45 years in prison. 45 years? Why didn't he get life? Why didn't he get life? 41, where is your emergency? Uh, my house. Okay, what's the emergency? Uh, I just killed my mom and my sister. Oh my what? god. I just killed my mom and my sister. You just killed your mother and your sister? How did you do that? Wow. Uh, wow. I with a, uh, 22 revolver. Are you sure they're dead? Yes. Oh my goodness. The disbelief in the operator. She was like, what? Man. Next up is Brian Sweat. At the age of 27, he committed mass murder in Greenwood County, South Carolina. His victims ranged from the ages of 9 to 51 years old. Oh my God. Among the victims were Chandra Fields, the mother of Sweat's baby daughter, both of her parents, and two of Chandra's nephews. It is believed that Sweat had broken in and waited for the victims in their home while they were out, and then took them hostage as soon as they returned. Good God. He bound them with duct tape and then shot the majority of them. He then called 911 and calmly told the operator that he was about to commit suicide and that he was extremely stressed. He also told them that he had a weapon in hand. Greenwood 911, may help you. Oh yes, I need an officer at 2007 Callison Highway. What's wrong? Oh, I'm just stressed out and I'm about to take my life. And I mean, it, what's your name? Please it's, it's unknown. Okay, do you have a weapon with you? It's his, he's so calm as he's talking. So calm, like no emotion in his voice. Huh? Do you have a weapon with you? Yes. Get in there. Don't point at me. What's going on? Wow. 
Before the tragedy took place, Sweat wrote many Facebook posts, stating how angry he was with Chandra, as according to him, Chandra was stopping him from seeing his daughter. Fortunately, there were some lives that Sweat spared on the day of the massacre, one of whom was his daughter, who he told to get out of the house, as well as four other children. Oh the children goodness. ran to a neighbor's house, and the neighbor also called 911. 3191. Um, this is. Yeah. I live at 2. What's going on? I just got four kids at my door that says that somebody just killed their mama. Oh my god. Wait a minute. Locked in this house. Look, I need at 2. At 20. She's got four kids there saying somebody just killed their mother. Oh, man. Oh, I'm getting chills. This is giving me chills. Sweat had a long history of violence and had previously been charged with assault. On the day he decided to take many people's lives, he was actually due in court for a burglary charge, and there was a possibility of him going to prison for 30 years. After shooting the five family members, Sweat turned the gun on himself. <sighs> wow. My gosh. Dale Cregan was well known in his hometown of Manchester as a hard man and was a notorious drug dealer, making up to 20,000 pounds a week. He enjoyed traveling and would always fly business class, even though he officially classed himself as a plasterer. While in Thailand, Cregan lost his left eye after getting into a fight. Back in England in May 2012, oh the 29-year-old got into another fight in a pub and ended up shooting and killing 23-year-old Mark Short. During the incident, Cregan also attempted to kill three other men. What? Two and a half months later, Dale Cregan traveled to Mark Short's 46-year-old father's house. Hold on, so at this point, does he have a false eye? I think one of these eyes is a, is a prosthetic. And murdered him in the same fashion what? before throwing a hand- His dad! Hand grenade at his body. After being on the run for some time, on September 18th, 2012, Cregan murdered two female police officers oh by shooting God. them at least eight times each and throwing an M75 hand grenade at them. In order to get the police to his house, he had made a hoax call to 999 and made up a story of an attempted burglary. On the phone, Cregan provided the phone operator with in-depth detail about the criminal and told them where the supposed criminal had fled to and even made a joke. What is really disturbing about this phone conversation is how he calmly told the operator that he would be waiting for the police. Police emergency. I heard someone just threw a big concrete slab through me that window and ran off. Of the house or a car? What are we talking? No, sorry, in my back window, in the house. In the house. What's the address there, please? 30 Abbey Gardens, Mosher. Did you see them? Seen one, yeah. So this guy's from up north. He's from somewhere like Manchester. Do you know them? No, I don't know. Okay. Did they, do you know why they've done it? I haven't got a clue. Okay. So it's all one person running off, yeah? Yeah. Which way have they ran? What direction? Ran there. Uh, there's a, like a field at the back, and I've just seen them running over the field. I can point it out to the officer. Wow, so he's making all of this up. All of this is just made up. Adam. What's your second name, Adam? Archery. Fake right, name. I'll get an officer up there, have a look around, see if they can see anybody similar, and then they'll come and see you. All right, Adam. How long would it take? Do you know we're roughly? I know that it's fucking. It's not that serious. But... Well, because it's just happened, it's gone in on the priority, so that's within the hour, certainly. But so okay, they'll try and get up there as soon as if there's a possibility. He's still knocking about. All right then. Thanks. This guy is a is a he's a bona fide psychopath. Like the way he just t spoke so like perfectly like there was no hint very convincing you know this is a guy who's killed multiple people like i think they say psychos they can mimic emotions and things like that this guy he's he's one of those to a t thanks very much okay i'll right. wait uh, i'll be waiting all, all right. right all right adam all right, bye -bye. Bye -bye. once the police officers arrived at the house in greater manchester cregan opened the door and immediately began shooting at God. the officers who unfortunately did not have a chance to react after the brutal murders, Cregan traveled to a local police station and handed himself in. He told them proudly that he was wanted by the police and then confessed to his awful crimes. Insane. On June 13, 2013, Cregan was found guilty of four counts of murder and three counts of attempted murder and was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. <sighs> Jeez, man. What makes you do something like that? Was it the fact that he lost his eye? Was it 
something that was always within him. Like, why? Why why do this? Like, you've ruined your life now. You're going to spend the rest of your life behind bars. Why? On August 3rd, 2010, Omar Thornton was called into his place of work at the Hartford Distributors in Manchester, Connecticut, and was confronted with security camera footage which showed him stealing beer. Oh, the 34-year-old no. was a delivery driver for the distributors, and because of the theft was given the options of either resigning from the company or being fired. Thornton decided to sign the resignation papers. Shortly after the signing, and without warning, Thornton pulled out two semi-automatic pistols, oh which he had been God. concealing in his bag, and opened fire. In a matter of minutes, he had murdered eight employees what? and seriously injured two others. After the shooting was over, Omar locked himself in an office and called his mother and informed her of the massacre. He also told her that he was about to take his own life. He then called 911 and gave his reasons for the shooting. Here is the call. Stay police. It is 911. Yeah, can I help you? This is Omar Thornton, the, uh, the shooter over in Manchester. Yes, where are you, sir? I'm in the building. Uh, it's, uh you probably want to know the reason why I shot this place up. And this place here is a racist place. Yep, I understand they, that. Uh, they treat me bad over here. and treat all other black employees bad over here, too. So I think it's my own hands and uh, handle the problem. I wish God, oh my God. This is not how you handle situations like this. Oh, man. I wish I could have got more of the people. What? Yeah. Are you armed, sir? Do you have a weapon with you? Oh, yeah, I'm armed. How many guns do you have with you? I got one now. I one out, one out in the, uh, in the uh, factory there. Yep. Okay, yeah, sir. I'm, I'm not going to kill nobody else, though. Yeah. We're gonna to have to have you surrender yourself somehow here. Not make the situation any worse, you know what I mean? These cops are gonna kill me. No, they're not. We're just gonna to have to get you to relax. To, I'm back to calm down. To have you, you know, turn yourself over. How much ammunition you have with you? I got a lot of shots left. Oh. What's that? All right. I guess this conversation is over. I have to take care of business. Um. My people, I love them. Yeah. And I gotta go down. Oh my. After the call ended, Thornton took his own life by shooting oh, himself wow. in the head before police could get to him. His family and ex girlfriend claimed that he had complained many times that he was being racially discriminated at work. His ex also claims that she saw a picture on his phone which showed racist graffiti inside the bathroom where he worked. Wow. The company's president, other employees, and union officials are adamant that the racist claims are not true. Oh, man. Oh. Oh my gosh. I mean, I can I can't I can't empathize with what he did at at all. You know, he murdered he murdered people, you know. Like, surely, like, was there no way for him to take his complaints to some kind of external, I don't know, external enforcement or some kind of union, maybe? Like, man, to, 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 to murder those people, dude. The last killer on this list is probably the most infamous, as he made numerous chilling phone calls over the span of two years. His phone calls to the authorities were so strange that he was nicknamed the Weepy Voiced Killer. His name was Paul Michael Stefani. After each brutal crime he committed, he would call the police in an emotional manner and confess, but would never give his name. What? It all started on New Year's Eve in 1980, after he beat a female named Karen Potak so badly that she gained a brain trauma and was close to dying. The 21-year-old was walking home from a New Year's party late at night in Minneapolis when she was brutally attacked with a tire iron. Oh my God. Stefani then called 911 and informed the police where the woman was. Yes, please, this is an emergency. Please send a squad to Pierce Butler Road, uh, Malmberg Manufacturing Company, Machine Shop. Please, there's an ambulance, too. There's a girl hurt there. 
why why is he sounding like that it doesn't even sound sincere it doesn't really sound like he's crying almost like he's putting it on just so he can appear you know contrite like a remorseful can you tell me what happened to him there's two reasons and she's laying on the ground in the back by the by the railroad tracks by the edge of what, what's the address i don't know who are you Police found Karen, and she was taken to the hospital with severe injuries, but survived the attack. Thank goodness. Stefani's next victim was 18-year-old Kimberly Compton. Kimberly accepted a ride from Stefani in June 1981 after meeting him in a diner. Using an ice pick, Stefani stabbed the teenager 61 times. Oh my God. And then once again called 911 and confessed. 61 times. You find me, I just stab somebody with an ice pick. I can't stop myself. I can't. This guy, he's putting this on. He's. Guys, do you think this is his real voice? Like, I've never heard somebody. Killing somebody else. Two days later, Stefani called back and apologized for the murder and claimed that he would turn himself in. However, he never did. Eight days after killing Kimberly, the weepy voice killer called 911 and yet again oh, apologized. Oh, gosh. Don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry what I did to Compton. I couldn't help it. Don't know why I had this tavern. I am so upset about it. I keep getting drunk every day and I can't believe it. It's like a big dream. Oh, I can't think of being locked up. If I get locked up, I'll kill myself. I'd well, mate, you deserve to be locked up for what you did. I can't imagine being locked up. <sighs> to kill myself, to get locked up. I'll try not to kill anybody else. In 1982, Stefani murdered another woman, Kathleen Whoa. Greening, by drowning her in her bathtub. Oh but this God. time did not call to confess the crime. Later that year, Barbara Simons was stabbed over 100 times and her body was found in a Minneapolis river. Two days later, police received this call. Please don't talk to this lesson. I'm sorry I killed that girl. I stabbed her 40 times. Kimberly Compton was the first one. Oh, my shape. Oh, oh, I don't know what's the matter. Me. If this guy, if this is genuine, I, I, what I mean by that is if he's actually crying on the phone, this guy, he is just a complete deranged psycho. You know, just completely deranged. Oh man, it's. <sighs> I'm gonna kill myself, I think. Where are you? I'm just gonna. I, if somebody dies with a red on it's me. I killed both of them. I'll never make it to heaven. Stefani's final victim was a 21-year-old prostitute named Denise Williams. Stefani picked her up and took her to his apartment to have sex. After leaving the apartment, instead of dropping the young woman back at the red light district as he had promised, Stefani drove down a dark and secluded road and brutally attacked her with a screwdriver. He stabbed her multiple times. Fortunately, Denise was able to strike him in the head with a glass bottle and managed to get away. As a result, Stefani was bleeding pretty badly, so he decided to call for medical help. Inve he called for medical help. Unbelievable. Can you imagine this guy? He's just, he's, he's a mass murderer. He's, he's just assaulted someone. He got hurt and he called for me. I'm, I, I can't believe it. Investigators recognized his voice and were able to link this call to the attack on Denise Williams and Stefani was arrested. Investigators were then also able to link Stefani to the murder of Barbara Simons, and in 1983, he was given a 40-year sentence. After many- Is that it? 40 years, that's all he got. Years in prison, in 1997, Paul Stefani confessed to all of his crimes, and police were able to officially link him to the weepy-voiced killer calls. Paul Stefani died in prison in 1998 after suffering from skin cancer. Thanks wow, for man, that was genuinely disturbing. I mean, that last guy, to be honest, all of them, just the, uh, the, the calmness in their voices as they either confess to their heinous crimes or, you know, they, they basically are trying to get officers to come to, to so they can, you know, murder them like like um the, the guy from uh, from the uk when he was when he called for those officers to visit him just so he could you know dispatch of them it was horrible i mean 
real psychos, real psychopaths, you know, people with zero remorse, zero emotion. It's frightening. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.